Aluminum is wealth. That sounds strange. It's cheap. It's a recent invention. It's not like gold that's been around forever. But the fact is, we can all get use out of things made of aluminum. And that's a kind of wealth. It's an example of a larger principle. When someone tells you that something is rare or scarce and expects you to think of that as value, remember this. Value comes from enabling more people to enjoy something not from preserving some kind of exclusivity. So where does aluminum come from, exactly? Well, it's an abundant element. Lots of rocks contain aluminum, but making aluminum metal is tricky. It's a very different process from making, say, iron or copper. Both of those, you just find the ore, cook it with carbon, and like in Minecraft, but more complicated, you get the metal. If you try that with aluminum, you just get hot ore. This is bauxite from Saline County, Arkansas, it's basically dirt. With some very difficult and somewhat secret chemistry, in 1840, this rock could be converted into a light, bright, shiny metal that was basically priceless at the time. That was real-life alchemy. Base dirt worth less than the cheapest metal could be transformed into a substance rarer and more expensive than gold. There's a story probably apocryphal about Napoleon III. Sometime around 1850, aluminum was so rare and so expensive that the French emperor wanted some especially honored guests to feel very special. So their dinner was served with aluminum cutlery, while the less special guests had to eat their dinner with common gold flatware. In 1885, the capstone was placed on the brand new Washington Monument. The capstone was a pyramid cast from aluminum. By then, aluminum was about the price of silver. Today, aluminum is so cheap it's basically disposable. For the price of an ounce of gold, you can have a literal metric ton of aluminum. So forget alchemy. Alchemy is for Dungeons and Dragons and Minecraft. This is real power. Take something cheap and useless and transform it not into something rare and expensive, but into something so useful that everyone can use it everywhere they can think of. Aluminum is for leftovers and soda cans, but also siding and industrial wiring. We build airplanes out of it. The way you make aluminum is like this. You grind up this bauxite ore, you dissolve it in a hot flux, a different kind of molten rock. Then electricity is used to convert that aluminum oxide dissolved in the flux into metal. Now, it does take a lot of electricity, and that's why Boeing is located in the Pacific Northwest. They used to use the cheap Washington hydroelectricity to make tons of aluminum for their Boeing planes. So look at some of the cool things we can do with aluminum. This is an aluminum honeycomb panel. It has an even higher strength to weight ratio than solid aluminum. It's a great material for planes where every ounce of weight counts against fuel economy. Aluminum can be machined, cast, 3D printed for advanced manufacturing of complex parts. It's lighter than other structural materials, so electric cars can get better range. It's lightweight and corrosion resistance make it perfect for solar panel assemblies. So they can go on lighter support structures and survive in remote locations. Aluminum is super useful, but it only got that way after we had the right knowledge and the ability to scale it way up. Capitalism did its thing for this, and government intervention helped. They helped provide the public land to place the dams for the hydroelectricity. They provided loans and public works to support and drive the industry. Ubiquitous aluminum represents democratic wealth. We have the ability, collectively, to create and use scientific knowledge, private enterprise, government policy, to turn useless rocks into a fundamental resource for industry and consumers. We all came together to support this one tiny aspect of human flourishing. Consider the other option. What if Napoleon III had managed to keep the methods to make aluminum secret? He might have wanted to keep the only source of this rare and valuable metal all to himself. If he'd managed to keep tight control over the supply and limit production, he might have extracted the highest price for each ounce of the metal he decided to produce. It might have remained like gold, rare, precious, and hoarded up in a vault. If aluminum metal had remained at gold prices, it would be worth $82 million dollars. Per ton. That's feudal wealth, the ownership of something scarce. In reality, aluminum sells for about $2,000 per ton, 40,000 times cheaper than gold. It's not scarce at all. Because of that, we have a material that we can use everywhere to make life better. Cheaper transportation, recyclable containers, every other application of a modern engineering material. 
There are real examples of feudal wealth, not just this imaginary thought experiment. Think of how companies work to preserve monopolies on access to movies or music. Think of the monopoly on insulin. Consider oil. Right now, a few companies own the oil rigs and the land, and they have an interest in the feudal kind of value. But if something came along and drove down that price of oil, like cheap electricity and electric cars, then that would ruin their fortune. Cheaper transportation is better for everyone except those oil barons, and they have no reason to take it lying down. Deliberately creating scarcity is the ugly temptation of feudal value. The owner of the bauxite mine and the oil well stands to get more wealthy by creating less value. That's called rent. It's called passive income, and it should be a dirty word. The idea of free markets didn't originally mean free from government, it meant free from rentiers. Rent-seeking is the opposite of the kind of value that science creates. Rent-seeking relies on authority. Science only recognizes the authority of nature. Rent-seeking relies on monopoly. Science works best when knowledge is freely shared. Rent-seeking is about scarcity. Science is about knowledge, which is infinitely abundant. There are ways to fight back against rent seekers, more education, more science, more unions, more enforcement of antitrust. Feudal rent seekers rely on monopoly control, and if too many companies have oil wells and bauxite mines, then they can't effectively create the scarcity, and they have to compete. It's not really inherently anti-capitalist to recognize this. The purpose of the economy is to help make more goods and services available to more people, not to protect the divine right of kings. Imagine if scarcity of energy, or medicine, or cars, or houses went the way of aluminum. Ubiquitous. Cheap. It feels like things are getting harder for ordinary people, but we need to remember that we still have all of the accumulated knowledge of centuries. We still have the power to make anything less scarce. If things seem scarce right now, it might be artificial. Energy isn't scarce because we're running out of it. It's scarce because somebody has a toll booth on the easiest route to make it. It's scarce because the toll booth owners want it to be scarce. As long as it stays scarce, their toll booths are profitable. Sometimes I think I hear echoes of this idea in lots of the discourse. It's rare and expensive, so it must be hoarded. It must be preserved for the deserving few. I don't hold to that. When something is valuable because it's rare or scarce, that sounds like a scam to me. Okay, that's enough. Thank you for watching. I've been Peter Allen. I'm a PhD chemist, host of this Science Curious channel. If you like this video, I hope you'll do the YouTube stuff and help me find more viewers just like you. Leave me a comment if you want to talk or if you want me to talk about something. Uh, you can leave me an email or a voicemail if you prefer. My contact information is in the description below. And my last video is about making lifespan more abundant. So I hope you'll check that out too. Thank you all very much. We'll see you next time.